designing a can. And really, Chuck, you really think I'm going to make a living designing cans for Campbell's Soup? No. If you do, it's not a bad living. I mean, they pay well. But the reason for starting off with some of these problems is they're fairly straightforward to understand the setup on. The idea is to just get you into the basics. Okay? When our kids started hockey, playing for the first time, I'd never gotten to play as a kid. We didn't have, we just didn't have money. We were lucky to have food. Okay? And I'm dead serious. We'd usually start running out about Wednesday. Okay? And when we started hockey with them, Yes, she found it. <laughs> when we started hockey with the kids, <coughs> they handed us this big bag with all kinds of pads and stuff in it. And they said, read the paper. And the paper was directions of what you put on first, what you put on next, what you put on after that. Because if you put the pants on first, you can't get other gear on. Okay. If you put your jersey on quick like, well, you can't get the chest protector on, you can't get the elbow pads on, so you got to put it on in a specific order. So the purpose of that paper was to get you into what order do things go in. The reason for these problems here is to start to move you, your thinking in the direction of here is the process of setting up and figuring out a problem. You may never do another box again in your life. The whole point of this is to start to get your mind thinking in a specific direction. Okay? So realize it's not because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, everybody here is going to make cans and boxes for a living. No, that's not it at all. Okay? So we were talking about the other day designing a box. And we were going to start out with a single piece of cardboard. And on the way over here, I was trying to remember, I think... We wanted the volume of the box to be 8 cubic inches, is that right? Is that what we wanted? Okay, good. And we were going to make this box by cutting out a tab on each corner. And when the tabs are cut out, you're left with a flap on this side. So you've got this flap here that you can fold up to make one side of the box. You'll have a flap here that you can fold up to make another side of the box. Okay, And you have the idea, I suspect, as you go around, you wind up with these four flaps that you fold up. Once these four flaps are folded up, you can then build your box. You just tape the four of them together. Does that make sense to everybody? And the question is, let's see, did I give you dimensions on the piece of paper? Yes, no? Not sure? Okay. I forget. Um, Okay, so we started it without numbers on there, right? Is that accurate? We had a length, we had a width, we had a height. And the height is going to be that whatever that little tab is that flips up. And we talked about the fact that the volume... Now, one of the things, and this is part of the thinking, part of what I'm trying to move you into, the volume of the box is going to be the length times the width times the height, isn't it? Okay? So we can rewrite the volume as length times width times height equals 8. And, ah, here's the other thing that I recall from the other day. Which shape does the base of this box have to be? A square. Now, this is another thing that people just zoom right on past unless it's been brought up to them. By it being a square, what do you know about the length and the width? They're the same. So what we're all 
also going to do is because it's a square, we're going to put a little note to ourselves that the length is going to be equal to the width. With the length and the width being equal, we can replace one of the variables with the other one. Okay? Hey, it's good to see you. Okay? So this is another one of those sneak attacks that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but just because we're doing this example, you can take one variable and rewrite it in terms of another one. Okay? So what I could do is I could come over here and where it says width, well gosh, I'll just put another length there. Does that make sense? So on the diagram itself, I have length, length, and height, which gets us down to two variables. Which is good news, because have we ever done any derivatives with three variables before? Haven't, haven't. Okay. We will in January. Okay, so this can be rewritten then as length times length times height equals h, which gives you L squared h equals 8. Is that about where we left off last time? I'm thinking that's about where the notes ended. Okay, so now what are you going to do? Well, we can rewrite h as 8 over L squared. And what that allows us to do is we can re we rewrote W in terms of L. Now we can replace H with something in terms of L. We started out with three variables, and now we have everything in terms of the same variable, don't we? All in terms of L. Well, that's good news. We've got it down to one variable. That's what we can work with. Okay, so we've got this box. Needs to have a volume of 8 cubic inches. Do we want to make this box in the most expensive or the least expensive way possible? Least expensive. Because when people get whatever the product is, I think I said jelly beans, what do they do with the box? They throw it away. They don't want to pay a bunch of money for something they're throwing away. Okay. That's why jelly beans no longer come in boxes. They come in plastic bags. It's cheaper. Right? Yeah. Okay. So what we want to really do is we want to minimize our cost. In this case, what that really means is minimize the amount of material we're going to use, doesn't it? Because the more cardboard you use, the more expensive the box gets to make. Everybody buy that? So when they say minimize cost and you're talking about something like this, even though we're talking about cost, you have to see past that to realize the cost is basically tied up in the material to produce the box. Some of it's labor, but it's going to cost you about the same to labor-wise. The, the, the sides are two inches high or one inch high. It's basically the same cost there. A little more tape, or you could use the same amount. Minimize the cost. What this really means is we want to minimize the amount of material. Okay, and what minimize the material really means is we want to minimize the surface area. So one of the biggest things I'm hoping that you'll get from this is when you're asked to minimize whatever it is you're asked to minimize, it's not uncommon for you to need to be able to look at, oh, they're talking cost. Cost mean is related to material. What I really need to minimize is the surface area, because the surface area refers back to material, doesn't it? Now, why would I go to surface area? Well, the reason I go to surface area is because could we figure out the surface area of that box? Yeah. We can write a formula for surface area. That's how I got from cost to surface area. Started with cost, I'm thinking, okay, what really dictates cost?
cost. Okay, how can I write that as a formula? This is why people get paid big money in business to be able to do analytics and stuff. You know these jumps that we just made? That's what they're paying you for. If you go into that area of business and you're making big money starting at like 80 grand or thereabouts, starting, of course there are benefits and perks and stuff like that to go along with it, okay? It's because you can make these jumps, you can make these connections, you can make these hops that nobody else thinks about even doing. Well, yeah, we need to get it done. I don't know how we're going to do it. Marco always figures. Hey, Marco, could you help us again? Got to keep that man around here. Okay. That's what happens. Okay. So, surface area. What we're really after here is surface area. Okay, so we're ready to start the problem. Ready to start it? Yeah, ready to start it. Look at this box. Tell me about the surfaces of the box. What are some of the parts? The sides and the base. Okay, that's simple enough. The surface area is going to be the base plus the sides. And it's good to start out simple. That you can work with. How many bases does this box have? One of them. And looking at our information, what are the dimensions of the base? Length times length. Oh, so the base is going to have an area of L squared. Does that make sense? Okay, now talk to me about the sides. Are they different sizes or are they the same size? They're the same size, so how many are we going to have? Four. We're going to have four of these things that are length times height. Now, be careful. Sometimes people will come up and they'll ask me, well, gosh, Chuck, do I add or multiply the base and the sides together? Okay. Think about what we're doing here. Okay, what we're doing in this case is we've got something like this, right? And we're going to fold these up like that. Now, I do it with the other two sides, but it really not be easy to do. And then to figure out the total amount of paper we have, to get the total amount of paper, do we take this side times this side? Or do we take this side plus? this side. You add them, don't you? You just add the different pieces together. Which is why we have the base plus the sides, not the base times the sides. Now that you've heard it, maybe, oh yeah, that's pretty obvious. But, until we've thought it through, sometimes it's not. But that's fine. That's why you're here. Okay, so our surface area is this we can do another maneuver. Right now we have how many variables in that equation? Two. We have length and height. We really want to get it down to one. How can we do that? Well, let's see. Take a look back up here. Look at that. Will that allow for a substitution in the equation? In place of h, we can put what? 8 over L squared. So we have L squared plus, there's our plus, 4L times, we're going to do our 8 over our L squared. This will clean up a little bit. L squared plus 32 over L. Everybody with me so far? What value of L are we not allowed to use in this formula? Zero. Because it's going to give you the zero in the denominator. However, would we want to build a box that has zero length anyway? 
So it's nothing we need to worry about. Okay? So as you're moving along through these, always keep an eye out for, uh-oh, this number or that number may be a problem. Here, L equals zero is a problem. All right, if we want to minimize this, what do we do now? Well, to find a maximum or a minimum, you do the derivative. So to set this up to do a derivative, because I'm thinking ahead to where I'm going to be going next, I'm going to rewrite this as x or x squared, l squared plus 32 times l to the negative 1. Does that make sense to everybody? Do you see that that's easier to compute a derivative of? Okay. Hey, wait a minute. How much calculus have we done so far? None. You see all this work we've done? A whole screen's work. And none of it's calculus. Okay, well, don't blink, because the calculus is about to come and go. To compute our min, that means we need to compute the derivative of the surface area, right? And we want to take that derivative and set it equal to 0. Hey, there's a good question in that for the final exam. Why do you always set the derivative equal to 0? And we've talked about that, I bet you, at least 60 times. I'm not going to bore you with that anymore. If you want to hear it again, go back to one of the old movies. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to try to locate a minimum. Now we got to be careful because we might come up with a maximum. Do we want to use a maximum in this case? No, because that means you're building the box as expensively as you possibly can. That'll get you fired. True? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so we're going to take the derivative here, and we're going to set it equal to zero. So the derivative of this thing, s prime, is going to be 2l minus 32l to the negative 2. Remember back when that was hard to do? You have come a long way, and you're going to go a lot longer way before April gets here. Okay, I promise you. We want to solve this equal to 0. Easiest way to do this is to rewrite this as minus 32 over L squared equals 0. Okay. This is going to give us 2L equals 32 over L squared. Multiply both sides by L squared. Divide both sides by 2, and this gives you L cubed equals 16, and what's the cube root of 16? How would you do the cube root of 16 on your calculator? Uh-oh. Okay, in math there might be the cube root. And you can always do it as raise it to the one-third power. I usually just do it like that. Primarily because I've never looked in math for it. Because I've always just done it the other way. 16 raised to the one-third power is going to be about 2.52 inches. A little over two and a half inches. Now, before we go any further with this, what do we have to check about this value? Don't just assume this is your minimum. We have to see if it's a max or a min, don't we? Oh, that's right. How are you going to do that? We can take the second derivative. We can put it in there. The other thing we can do is working with the first derivatives. We can draw our line at 2.52. We can look at the first derivative at 1 and the value of the first derivative at 3, or we can do the second derivative. Well, gosh, Chuck, which should I do? Whichever you're more comfortable with. This is going to be 2 minus 64. Sorry, it's going to be plus 64 L to the negative 3, which is the same thing as 2 plus 
64 over L cubed. If we use the second derivative, I don't care what the number is, I just want to know is it positive or negative. If you plug 2.5 into 2 plus 64 over L cubed, it's positive. And you don't even have to cube 2.5. 2.5 cubed is positive, isn't it? 64 divided by positive is positive. Positive plus 2 is positive. All I need to know is that it's greater than 0. If the second derivative is positive, what's that tell me about my value? Well, positive is smiling or frowning? Smiling. And smiling is a minimum. Ah, oh, this is a minimum. Okay? So when you work this stuff through, take the extra, how long does that really take? 15 seconds. Take the extra 15 seconds to verify it, and you get to keep your job. Probably worth 15 seconds of your time. So this does confirm that what we have here is a minimum. Now, what we need to come back to is what are the dimensions of the box? True? Because if you just come back to your boss, Marco comes back to me and says 2.52. way smarter than I am. I've got no idea. Okay? you got to put it back into a context that makes sense to them, don't you? On this box, the length is 2.52 inches. The width, oh, that's right, because it's the same as the length, we can use that word, width, is 2.52 inches. Uh-oh, oh, jeez. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. How are we going to get the height? Yeah, see where it says, it's highlighted in yellow there. The height is going to be 8 divided by 2.52 squared. What's the height going to be? Yeah, 1.26 inches. Now, how did I know to stop at two decimal places and not go out 73 decimal places on this thing? Well, think about what we're building, a cardboard box. Is a hundredth of an inch really that big of a deal on a cardboard box? No. What if I did three places? Chuck, is that okay? Fine, that's good. What if I did 83 places? Really? Okay, so what are the dimensions of this box that minimize the total cardboard needed to build it? There they are. That's all there is to it. Now, one of the things I want you to notice, we did a whole lot of work here, didn't we? There's all that, and there's all that. Two screens worth. How much of it was calculus? There was a quick little blurb here, a quick little blurb there, and everything else is algebra. Realize that the calculus part is the important part. This is what gets you across the finish line. But your algebra, all that stuff you've learned up to this point is not wasted. You're going to need every single bit of it before the year is out. And I do mean every single bit of what you have learned in algebra class. Probably even more. Maybe some stuff you might pick up. Okay? Question, Raj? Can you do another example? Yes, I will. In fact, let's do a can. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Let, let's build a can. You said, can we do another example, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Boy, you stepped right into that one, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there's that one done. Now, thought process, the same. The shape is different. Several years ago, was at a um, national conference. Got to hear one of the engineers from Campbell's Soup Talk. Oh, that's got to be about as exciting as watching paint dry. Okay, Actually, it was really pretty cool because what the guy was sharing with us is on the stuff that they build, okay, how many cans of soup do they make a year? Seven billion. 
On seven billion cans of soup a year, if you could save one square inch of metal per can, is that a significant savings to Campbell? Yes. That is millions of dollars. Little bitty things add up to millions of dollars by the time you run it out on production scale. And he even made the comment, Campbell Soup will pay anybody, you know, several million dollars. If you can give them a can dimensions that use less material than theirs. So you come up with it, handing the numbers, they'll check it, cut you a check for two or three million dollars right now. Of course the catch is, yes sir? That's what, well, yeah, they, they want different dimensions because they know they can make it mater thinner material. I don't know if you've watched these water bottles you know the bottle, bottle of water? It's been interesting to watch those bottles evolve over the years. Really, Chuck? That's no wonder that you've got nothing online. You think watching them build water bottles is fun. Have you noticed they're easier to crunch? Hey, what's happened to the height of the cat? Half of what it is. Really? Does half the length of a cat make that much difference? Yes, it does. Does making the material a smidge bit thinner make a difference? Yes, it does. Okay, and they're constantly looking for stuff like that. Okay, so let's talk about the cans. This isn't just for Campbell Soup. This is for any of them. Okay, at home, they have to put up with me making sure that everything gets recycled. Peel the labels off of the cans. Have you ever seen one of those cans without the label on it? What's the side look like? It's ridges, isn't it? In fact, I really didn't draw correctly here. The side of these cans has this deal on it. Is that to make it easier to hold on to? Nope. It has nothing to do with you holding on to it. You know why they put that there? It makes it harder to crunch. It actually makes it stronger. And it's cheaper to make it stronger by putting the zigzags in than by making the sidewalls thicker. It uses less material. That's how careful they are on where they're using their material. They can make it thinner walls, slightly thinner walls, and the extra material you use in the zigzag is less material than by using a, a thicker wall. Really? Really. Okay. Let's say we got a can. needs to have a volume of, let's say, 27 cubic inches. Question is, what dimensions will minimize the material on the can. Now we're cheating. We're not including the zigzag into the material. We're doing this the easy way. Okay. What dimensions of a can will contain 27 cubic inches of material using the minimum amount of metal? Well, that's kind of like the box question, isn't it? Except now we're dealing with something round instead of something square. Works the same as the box, so where do we start with the box? Well, we started with the volume. How do you figure out the volume of a can? Height times the area of the base, that's exactly it. Okay, here's something to tune in on. Whenever you've got something where the side is perpendicular to the base, to get the volume of that thing. Suppose it's in the shape of a star or the shape of a diamond or whatever. It doesn't matter what the shape of the base is. To get the volume, you take whatever the area of the base is times the height. Okay, so the volume is going to be the area of the base <coughs> times whatever the height's going to be. For this particular shape of container, what is the formula for the area of the base? Pi r squared. Okay, so the volume is going to be pi r squared times 
times the height. And that has to equal what? 27. Okay, we're going to hold on to that. Notice there are two variables there, radius and height. There are two things you can vary on the can. Okay, the radius and the height. What we are really concerned about, it, once again, is we want to minimize the surface area. Okay, so the first thing let's do is let's make a parts list. What pieces do we need to build a can? It's okay, it's not that hard. What are the pieces? Top, bottom, or two bases. Okay. Two bases. One we're going to use for the top, one we're going to use for the bottom, and the side. Okay, what is the formula for the area of the base? It's pi r squared. The side. What's the formula to compute the area of the side of a can? Very good. Okay. Watch this. This is as close as Chuck gets to working magic. Okay. Here we have a can. The side of a can, right? Nothing in there. Okay. The distance around. Run out of hand. There we go. The distance around here is the circumference, isn't it? And the height is there. Now watch the circumference. You ready? <laughs> I know it's sad. It's pathetic. It's as good as it gets. Okay? What's the circumference become? The length. Okay? <laughs> if you go home and practice for weeks, you might be able to do that too. Actually practice for seconds. Okay, so the side of this thing is really going to be a piece of metal like that. The length of it is going to be the circumference. There's the height. What's the formula for circumference of a circle? 2 pi r. It's the derivative of the area. The derivative of the area is the circumference. It's no coincidence. Okay, so the side is going to have an area of length times height. So that's going to be 2 pi r times the height. This is the formula that we want to take the derivative of. But there's a problem because we have how many different variables in it? Two. And we need to get it down to one. Suggestions? Good luck. Well, the 2 pi is a number, so that's good. I'll give you a hint. Just gave you a hint. What's the highlight? Solve for H. Very good. If you solve for h, h is going to be equal to this 27 over the pi r squared. Does that make sense? That allows us down here to substitute 27 over pi r squared for where h was. Is everybody good? Thank you. Where are you? There you go. Jokes aren't any better than the magical jokes, huh? Okay. We can clean this up a little bit. We're going to have 2 pi r squared plus, now the 2 times the pi times the 27 is going to give us 54 pi. Now, one of these R's 
will cancel with that, leaving us with pi r in the denominator. What else will clean up? Uh, the pi will cancel. This then gives us that the formula for surface area is 2 pi r squared plus 54, and I'm going to rewrite this as r to the negative 1 because we're setting up to compute the derivative. Yeah, you're on it. You take the derivative now, and now what do you do? You, get, you got the derivative, and what do you do with the derivative? Set it equal to zero. You solve for r. Hey, do you feel like you're back on home turf again? Yeah, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for the variable, make sure it's the max or the min by using the second derivative. Ta-da, it's all done. True? Pretty cool. We'll stop here for now. Why don't you get started on the quiz here a little bit. Okay. We've got this on this OneNote stuff, so we can pick up right here on next Friday. Oh, that's right. Why are we starting here on next Friday? Because the test is next Wednesday.